As Kathy said, my name is Gene Rank. I'm your moderator today. I'm at the University of Kansas. I'm honored to be joined by two esteemed colleagues, Peter Burgess and David Gold. They'll spend a few minutes in just a second with some prepared remarks. And then, as Peter said, then it's kind of a free for all. We don't know what'll happen. <laughs> but uh, ask your questions as we have been using the chat function, everyone, and I'll do my best to keep track of them and raise them with Peter and David. And my job is to keep the discussion going and on track. And I assume I was asked to do so because as my students always tell me, a fool can ask more questions than a wise man can answer. And so hopefully I'll be able to keep them busy with, with my question if, if you all don't come up with any. But uh, by way of introduction, I'll introduce them first now and then we'll go into their PowerPoints. Peter Burgess, I asked Peter, what can I say about you, Peter? By way of introduction, he said, well, tell them that I'm a nerd, but obviously I like numbers. <laughs> so Peter tries to persuade skeptics that he's just not, only, not just a slightly irrelevant, but lovable nerd, known for <laughs> numerical modeling and statistical analysis. He also has lots of experience with odd crop and subsurface interpretations. He's simply trying to work out ways how to use the quantitative stuff to make interpretations of real world strata more robust. We're also joined by David Gold, who presents second, and he works as a biostratigrapher and a carbonate sedimentologist for CGG Geology. He has 10 years experience working in carbonates, predominantly in Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, the Americas, and the Middle East. In his dual role as micropaleontologist and sedimentologist he uses both fossils and the rocks themselves, heaven forbid, to understand environmental change in carbonate strata. So with that, let's see if I can advance the slides. Peter. Great, Gene, thank you very much. So um, I'm just gonna do a quick intro, which hopefully sets the scene. And I think Dave is gonna follow with something that's a little bit more specific. So. The issue that, as I see it, the reason why we need to be more quantitative, and I, I say this in recognition that, you know, things are generally getting more quantitative as the years pass, right? And we've seen that in the selection of talks that have just happened. But there is still an issue, I think, that the core of the subject, if you'll pardon the pun, that we, that we all, you know, work on, has this kind of workflow in it where we take conceptual models, we apply them to the outcrop subsurface, and we interpret those rocks using that conceptual model and the results go back into the conceptual model and we kind of go around in that circle and the danger with that is that if the model is such a strong influence on the interpretations and and i think probably it's it's fair to say even the observations that we make we can introduce a strong element of circular logic in here so that what we what we get out of the outcrop is to some extent at least maybe to a large extent just really a consequence of what's in those conceptual models the conceptual models are driving what we record and what we see so you know i often say to people if i want to be provocative quite a bit of this work is just modeling in disguise there's a strong element of modeling in there that is just not really recognized and uh, can you advance the slides gene and this is perhaps a slightly simpler way to put it, right? There's this thing called the law of the instrument. And basically what it says is, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The point being that the tool that you have influences what you see and what you can do. And of course we can extend that into geology. We could say the law of the geo instrument is that when all you have is a geological hammer and secret stratigraphy, and I pick on that because it's one of the more extreme examples, but it could be any number of conceptual models everything that you see is going to look like a high frequency accommodation cycle because that's what the model tells us is there and that's what we should look for right so it has an influence on on everything we do so the question is how do we break away from that influence how do we break that potential circular logic next slide please gene so and i, I think the answer to this is we introduce quantitative methods because as we've seen in some of the talks that have been done uh, today they are at least in some ways more objective, right? They, they introduce a different way of looking at things. They introduce, so quantification introduces more objective data, potentially more objective analysis. You know, it's not always true. And it gives you the chance to actually break that circle. So um, and by, by quantification, what I mean, you know, there's several different things it could be. So we could do, for example, some numerical forward modeling to test the assumptions that are behind some of those conceptual models. We could do statistical analysis to find out whether what we're actually describing as patterns in the rock really are. We could begin to use machine learning techniques to, to take things that are very subjective and try and make them a bit more objective to kind of encode what we know about things in, in a quantitative way. All of these things can potentially break that 
circle. OK, so that's that's my point, I think, to try and get the discussion started. If you vehemently object to being called a modeler in disguise, then then that's what we can debate um, next. Once Dave, once Dave has given his view. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. And thanks for the introduction, Gene. If you could just sort of skip to the next slide. Uh, so quantifying uncertainty is one of the, the biggest challenges that we have in, say, carbon exploration, uh, especially if you're trying to calculate things like reservoir thickness or volume, whether you're looking for hydrocarbon reservoirs or maybe even um, carbonate sequestration targets. And one of the best ways to deal with this really is using one of those quantitative tools that Pete was just talking about. And we can run various uh, types of uncertainty analyses using stratigraphic forward models. Um, so you, in these models, you can run sort of multiple simulations of your depositional model. So you could run, for, it, for instance, your model 100 times and look to see how many times out of that 100 a particular feature that you're interested in is occurring, um, slightly changing the, the, the boundary conditions slightly. Um, and the images on this slide just show the results of some of these uncertainty analyses. And in this example, we've chosen a um, uh, the Schweiber formation, which is a, a fairly important carbonate reservoir in, in the Middle East. And um, the, the top row of images show sort of a two dimensional map of reservoir thickness. And the, the bottom row of images show, um, show the 3D uh, volume distribution. Um, and you can see how these change with different model runs and different simulations. And, and here I've, I've shown sort of the P, P90, P50, and P10. And these are your sort of best case, worst case, and average scenarios when you're predicting things like reservoir thickness. And you can see if I just choose, choose thickness, for instance, there's a range of, of thicknesses here from around about sort of 16 meters all the way through to sort of 33 meters. So you can see that range of uncertainty and you really need to kind of capture that um, so you're fully prepared with, you know, for what you're dealing with when you're targeting a, a specific uh, a carbonate reservoir. So if you can just change the next slide, please. So these maps show that, you know, not only does thickness change, but also your sort of fascist distribution changes as you change the, the different uh, boundary parameters in these models. And, and there's, there's a whole range of fascist variability. So you can see this is a, a, the evolution of the Schweiber at various different time slices through, through the Aptian. Uh, color coded by different um, sort of carbonate fasces. Um, and if you're particularly interested, for example, in um, your distribution of bioconstructed carbonates, so these might be rudest reefs or other kind of reefs and, and buildups, uh, and, and you wanted to target that, target that as a specific reservoir, um, they're sort of mostly wi most widespread in, in simulation 10, and you can see the parameters on, on the left-hand side, which we've changed here. So as you have sort of high average carbon accumulation rates and really low substance rates, you have a wider distribution of these, of these um, uh, bioconstructed carbonates. And then in the other, diff in the other simulations, sort of five and 24, once you reduce the carbonate accumulation rates and, and you have variable degrees of substance, you have less widespread carbonate distribution. So it's really important to see what is controlling um, your distribution of carbonates. And as Pete suggested, is it all glacio-eustatic sea level change or is, it, is there some sort of subtlety relating to environmental changes that, that might be a stronger control on, on, on the deposition of these sequences? Um, so if you skip to the final slide then, Gene. Thanks. Uh, and, and you can use these maps to essentially create a series of risk maps or, or probability maps. You can layer these different models on top of each other and you say like a traffic light system to see how many times out of a hundred you get that particular feature that you're interested in. So um, if you've defined in this example that your reservoir thickness of interest is, is 20 meters, um, you can see in green in the, in the top image here, um, that sort of 75% plus of the time you, you're always getting this sort of con con confined to the, the, the margins of the platform here. But if you're targeting a, a, re a reservoir of 40 meters thickness, you can see there's fairly low probability of those kind of thicknesses occurring given those boundary conditions. And that's really important once you, you know, you're trying to calculate volumetrics in, in, these, uh, in these carbonate reservoirs. And if you just flip through to the next sort of three images, Gene, you'll see how we sort of traditionally do this type of work. So we've 
you know, in, in the past, we might uh, collect a series of world data, plot this on a map, and it's essentially a, a connect the dots exercise where you're drawing a line between um, sort of similar petrographic or, or log features, and then you're drawing this out on, on a map. So, you know, it, it's a lot more qualitative and open to interpretation and essentially only shows sort of one one scenario but the benefits of doing it this way is, is that you can sort of account for that sort of real range of uncertainty but I guess this is a is a discussion session so if there are other um, approaches or workflows that you think work better to quantify carbonates um, then I guess it's all open for discussion in, the, in this session so I guess I'll hand over to Jean now to, to open it up for questions. Okay well thank you thank you David thank you Peter okay so it's a, no questions yet so I'll, I'll kick a question off um <clears throat> is there is there really a conflict between qualitative approaches and quantitative approaches in the sense that do we usually start does the science usually start with a verbal description then go into a kind of a conceptual qualitative conceptual model and then into numerical models. Are we just seeing the evolution of the science or is, 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 there, is there a false dualism there? Or do you think it's real? Quantitative can't add more. We're we just adding more digits onto the end of the decimal place. Well, Gene, I, I would argue it, it changes the way that you do things quite significantly. So, so for example, what, what Dave just highlighted, you know, it, it means that you can actually consider more than one possible answer. And actually that, that, that's one issue I have with a, with a qualitative method is that they so rarely do that. You know, that the, the, the workflow tends to be, you make an interpretation and that's your preferred interpretation. And it's probably the only one that you actually present. And I think that's what's one thing that's always bothered me is that it, it's clearly not the only possible interpretation. There are lots and how do we actually then capture that range? And I think that's where quant quantified methods are quite, um, different. So, you know, it, it, you can certainly start with a qualitative approach. My issue is that you shouldn't stop there. You, you need to carry on and do the quantitative stuff. And sometimes the only way you can really justify even the qualitative interpretations that you've made is with some quantitative evidence to back them up. Yeah. And, and sometimes there can be sort of millions of dollars riding on um, these interpretations. So, you know, if you're wanting to drill a well, somewhere in the Middle East and you're targeting a specific reservoir thickness, you know, you want to be sure that you're accounting for that range of uncertainty and that range of thicknesses that you encounter. Because if you promise the, the drilling manager that you're going to encounter 40 meters of reservoir and you actually hit 20, then um, he's not going to be very happy with you. And you've probably wasted a lot of money there. So we had a, a, someone who, Fiona can't raise her hand as a co-host. So she, <laughs> So go ahead, Fiona, you want to, your, your yeah. hand is virtually raised. Hey, raised. No, two, two hands are raised. Okay, um, I guess my comment would be, uh, to Pete, I think it's Pete was saying, we start off doing this, or you were saying, we start off doing descriptive stuff and then we quantify. One of the things that I find is useful about building numeric models is that it requires you to look very carefully about which parts of the system we do actually understand and which parts we can quantify. And in doing so for a number of elements of our forward sediment model that has diagenesis built in, we tended to find there was quite a lot of quantitative data, really good data back in the 60s and early 70s. Um, and there was then things sort of moved to a slightly more descriptive mode and I think we're moving back to just to quantifying our descriptions um, but I would I would I would underline the, the the not just the need for quantification in modeling but the need for quantification in describing things and publishing the data that underlie the summaries that we get in papers do we have any comments on Peter, you're, you're nodding your head. Do you want to read uh, that? I mean, I, I agree, Fiona. I think it's really, it's really interesting when you think of that historical trend, isn't it? Because, because there was a move away from more quantitative stuff in, in the 80s, 90s, into, into the previous decade to now. Yeah, and I think we are slowly coming back. But um, I don't know. It's interesting to consider why that happened, isn't it, really? 
I mean, we could, you know, sequence stratigraphy was always more qualitative than quantitative for a long time, right? And that had a huge influence on a lot of what we do. And I, I personally don't think it's been a particularly positive influence in many ways. Actually, I know that's perhaps quite a contentious thing to say, but I think it's true. So I, I you know, I agree with what you're saying. And regarding numerical models, absolutely. I mean, they are, amongst other things, a repository of knowledge because they, they you know, you, you, you put into them what you think you understand about how the system works in a quantitative way. And they're really useful for that, actually, because what they usually highlight is that we don't understand very much. But it's useful to know that, actually. Well, a back Stephen, that, you have a I, would, I agree completely. It tells us what we don't know. And that's that to me, that's the best thing about modeling. Modeling can quantify what we, if we produce a model that predicts what we expected to see, we can at least say, yeah, but it means that the scaling factor is this, or we can quantify relationships. But for me, the exciting thing about modeling is when it tells you things you didn't expect. And then you go back and question your assumptions and it all gets more fun. Stephen, you had your hand up first and then Rachel and then Volker. So Stephen, go ahead. Okay, I'm hoping I don't cause feedback, so I'm hoping you can hear me. Right, okay. Um, no, I just wanted to, um, you know, reinforce what Fiona said. We, 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 I, I was brought up very much in a qualitative era, um, but the, we do need to move absolutely back to more quantification. And those of us, David, will absolutely back this up coming from the angle he's coming at. It, when you talk to anybody in industry, they don't give a darn about qualitative. They need a number. They need a number between one and 10 to put into a model. That's what they need. So at the end of the day, if we can't work in that quantitative universe, then we can't work with those people that we're serving. And that's going to, that it traditionally has been the oil industry, but it's going to be exactly the same for, C, uh, for uh, CCS, et cetera, move in, the, you know, the, the resource of the future water as we move into the future. So I just think quantitative, quantitative, quantitative. I hate sex, my math stinks, but yes, that's where we need to go. Rachel, you had your hand up next. Rachel, you're on mute and Hello. Rachel. Yes, we can't, we can't unmute it. Sorry. Um, we got to know. We okay. can't. I can't. I can't put the camera on. Actually, it's, it's Andrew Curtis here. I'm sort of Hi, sliding on on the side. Hi. Yeah, I sneaked Andrew in. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it happened to be in the same house. Um, so I just um, wanted to comment on uh, the, the, I suppose, the, the initial presentation from Tom and David. Um, so the Models can only be constructed, numerical models can only be constructed based on conceptual models. And so the, the conceptual qualitative understanding comes first, and then one can sort of numerically model that. Now, the one problem that can arise with numerical models is that they take an enormous amount of effort to construct. So they're, they're not simple to construct, they take a lot of work, and that leads you down a particular rabbit hole with certain boundaries on it, which are the, you know, the conceptual models. <laughs> So um, th that's a danger. The good thing about it is that once you've got those models, you can vary the parameters, as Dave said, to uh, sort of get your uncertainties. But I would just say that one thing that I've experienced is that um, those uncertainties tend to get stepwise larger when you introduce a different model. And that's because of the bounds that you put on yourself when you construct these numerical models, that if you introduce another concept, things change really quite dramatically. So, um, so I just wonder to what extent, uh, you know, we balance out these sort of restrictions from modeling versus, versus the advantages that we get from being able to do quantitative uncertainty analysis. I wondered if you had comments. I think, yeah, interesting comments. And uh, I think with anything, you know, whether you're doing a qualitative approach or a quantitative approach and you're creating these models, you should always think with your sort of scientific and geologist hat on and say, you know, does this make sense? Is this within the realms of, you know, geological accuracy and possibilities? And I think sort of touching 
slightly on, on, on what Fiona has said, you know, moving back to, to the quantification of our descriptions, it'd be really good if we had a repository somewhere, an open access to a repository of, of data that says, you know, these are the carbon accumulation rates all over the world in different basins and um, different environments and things like that, that you could then check that the, your input parameters into these models are actually sort of geologically sensible and fall within an, an analogous sort of situation. Um, perhaps I think I'll hand over to Pete to perhaps discuss the, the increasing um, range of uncertainty that, that you get when you introduce it into these models. So, hey, Andy, that's it's a really interesting point, actually, that, that we should probably be aiming when we, when we do something that we think is particularly important in trying to understand the depositional system or whatever it is, to use more than one model to do it right for exactly the reasons that, that you've outlined and I, I, it isn't typically done uh, you know but i i've i've done it a little bit with some carbonate modeling and it's a very interesting exercise because it, it does what you just described it highlights you know the different assumptions that underpin those different models but also it highlights what is common between them and you know the, the only thing i would say is a good numerical forward model is underpinned by some pretty simple physics ideally right and that that should be i mean one would hope you know reasonably robust as a, as a way to to model things so i i would hope that there's at least some firm ground there for us to base things on in in, in that and then you know you you if you if you experiment properly and change your experimental setup use different models i think you can still make progress I mean, it would be interesting, for example, to compare, you know, the, the, the maps that Dave showed produced by a series of different models and see what they had in common, how they differed. I mean, I don't think anybody's done that, but it, it is definitely one of the next steps we should pursue. I agree. And it, the, the final point is it is much easier to create these models now than it was 10 years ago, you know, because programming languages are just so much more um usable than they were with big libraries of functions and things you know when 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 we were phd students together and it, it was all oh, those were the days it was very different back then you had to write everything from scratch but now you know you don't so you can put things together much more um it is still time consuming but it's not as time consuming as it used to be and there are repositories of forward models that are you know getting bigger all the time so csdms if anybody knows what that is is, is a great example there's a lot of models there that you can use yeah, I think that the models don't necessarily need to be big and complicated. And, you know, there's a range of different models out there or modeling software out there that, that you can use um, to, you know, answer a specific geological question that, that, that you're hoping to address. And, um, you know, I, I kind of see these as, as sort of digital sandbox models, essentially. And, you know, your input parameters you can obtain from, 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 from anywhere, really. And, and you know, if you have some seismic data, for example, you, you can export the, the grids and produce a surface and then essentially spill digital sand over it and see, see how that, that accumulates. Um, so they don't necessarily need to take a lot of sort of effort to build from the outset. So I think these things are getting easier and easier and, 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 and yeah, easier to, to run in general. Hey, thanks, guys. Peter, just one comment. We did in 96 at our numerical experiments in stratigraphy meeting in Lawrence. We had everyone give them the same input and had them run and see how the models came out and then look, compare, try to quantify they compare how distinct they were. So we did that once, but that was kind of a community effort. And that was 25 years ago, over 25 years ago. So, okay. Um, we have Volker. Volker, if you're up next, and then next would be Isaac, Alana. And then Alana had, apparently has some problems posting to everyone, questions to everyone. So, Steve, if you could uh, address that. So Alana had a question, Fiona, and then Marianne had a question after that. But Volker, you're up next. If you could uh, unmute yourself and show us. Yeah, yeah. OK, questions. so this is Volker. You know, I'm, I'm in Saudi Arabia, in case you don't know uh, by, by now. And I have uh, uh, I, I put on my ac academic hat right now. So a lot of the, um, the uh, depositional models are, uh, you know, very super simplistic, right? That, that we used to have, uh, that also fed the, the sequence strat uh, models, etc. And And, you know, Gene knows that very well. We're looking now at hydrodynamics and the input of, uh, of how, you know, how flow you know, uh, distributes sediments in, in a much different way than we used to before. So I think, 
you know, the round is open for another much more detailed investigation in modern carbonate environments to uh, see how hydrodynamics uh, influence this and then how we would have to adjust or uh, modify depositional models to, to come a bit closer to, to reality, right? So, and uh, then there was a, there was a, a, a thought on that, that Stephen said that, okay, now I'm putting my industry head on, my old one. And uh, so the, the guys in industry want a number. Now, Steve is, you know, I, I, I slightly agree with it, uh, disagree with this. They don't only want a number, but they want to have the uncertainty as well, because all investment decisions have to be robust in the view of uncertainty, right? So if, if, if your best model is like this, but something else comes in, you, you still don't want to have a disaster on your hand. And this is something I, I think who said, Mariana asked this, uh, do we need to, you know, the, uh, a model without the knowledge of its uncertainty is completely meaningless. Well, you know, it, it, it definitely is better if you consider the uncertainty now. Yeah. So these are a couple of thoughts that, that uh, you know, we need to improve our depositional models by having more realistic uh, depositional models. And I think that implies that we have to go back to our tried and tested terrains and, and look again and measure, you know, and that comes back to Pete, you know, yeah, let's go in there and measure. It's much more complicated than, you know, our, our simple models often say. That's it. I agree, Volker. Thank you, Peter or David. Did you have any anything to add to that? Okay, Isaac, you had your hand up. You're next in line. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I is it, do I keep my video on or is it okay without it? What do you prefer? That's fine without. That's fine. All right. Cool. Uh, I you know I'm I know I'm kind of shifting a little bit here towards more image analysis. Uh, shifting the topic a little bit, but uh, what I'm proposing in my project is not groundbreaking by any means. It's all established in computer vision and in bioimaging and things like that. It's just that in the geosciences, there's been such a lag in adopting these technologies that it, it presented an easy opportunity, I can say. So, you know, I, uh, I had like two insights into this. Like I was thinking, why is there this lag existing? And uh, I came up with two things. Number one is we, we're not very comfortable with coding because we like our geology. So there's definitely a reluctance towards adapting that. And secondly, also the computers do our work, the work like classification or modeling so much faster and more quantitatively. So I guess, the, I don't know, but is there like a fear towards like, you know, our job is on the line <laughs> or hey, like, you know, that's just my thoughts. Um, I, well, that's some, some good points, Isaac. I mean, look, the point about other sciences first, we should definitely be taking what they can do and using it in earth science, because let's face it, I don't think there are many other sciences that think it's a reasonable result to draw triangles on top of a photograph and say that's, you know, that's your conclusion, honestly. So we should definitely be taking techniques from other, other sciences and applying them. Uh, is it going to cost us our jobs? I mean, you know, the whole machine learning and deep learning thing has been going on for a long time, hasn't it? And it, it's definitely exploded in the last few years. But um, from what I understand of it, any general algorithm that is capable of learning across the board is a long way off, right? So, I mean, that's what we can do, you know, with certain caveats. So I, I, I think it's going to be for a long time, it's going to be a symbiosis. I don't buy into this idea that we're all going to be, you know, subjected to, to you know we're going to become slaves of intelligent robots anytime soon i think that's a why <laughs> you probably draw a lot more triangles before that happens <laughs> yeah true <laughs> yeah it, it will always need a well you know for now at least anyway for a long time we'll always need a a, a qc at the end from a geologist to come in and just check it makes sense but you know if, if computers can automate a lot of the work I have to do, then I'm all for it. You know, I can go out, walk the dogs and spend some quality time doing things I enjoy and, uh, and then come back and leave the computer running and, and come back and see, see the result. That's, that's fine by me. 
Your what? dogs like it. Quite hard work, Dave. That's my experience. They they, they are hard work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they demand a lot of time. So <laughs> let the computers do do the rest of it. Okay, Alana had a question, and she she posted to me. She apparently had problems posting to everyone. Um, question to Pete, and question for David. So question to Pete. How do we balance between the time taken to create sometimes complex quantitative models and the speed to deliver those models? And for David, how do we reconcile this between distinctly different scenarios for the probabilistic P10, 15, P90? So Peter, why don't you go first? The balance between the time taken between yeah. creating complex yeah. models and the speed to deliver those models. So, well, you know, I don't think the models do necessarily need to be complex. I mean, so I used to, you know, I, when I worked in Shell, I used to go around the company doing um, sort of consultancy work for, for, for different teams, helping them with problems. And, and usually what I found was there was a lot of simple stuff that you could do to get started that had a big impact on, on, on their evaluation of uncertainty in, in, in lots of projects, you know, and it, 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 it you do that first and then you start to build models perhaps but even then the models don't have to necessarily be super complicated to 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 generate some new insight so to give you to give you an example most sequence strat models most depositional models are essentially 2d right they're not strongly three-dimensional so if you can build even a simple three-dimensional model that captures some of what happens or what varies along strike that's an instant win or if you can run instead of just one, you know, instead of just one conceptual model, you can run 10 that bracket a range of parameters like Dave showed. Again, you can do that pretty quickly. It's not too hard these days. That's a big win, right? So, so what, we're, what, what we're arguing for really is not super difficult to do or super complicated, but it is slightly different to what has been done typically in the past. And I think that's all I would ever argue for, that, you know, we just take it to that next step without getting too complicated. Thanks, Peter. So David, uh, her question again was, how do you reconcile the distinctly different scenarios between your probability P10, P15, P90? Uh, well, similar to what Pete said, really, I don't think you really need to reconcile them. You just need to capture that the differences are, are there and, and, you know, given various different boundary conditions over, you know, 100 model simulations or 1,000 model simulations, you know, whatever your computer power enables you to do, as long as that's kind of captured, you've got some figures there, some numbers you can deal with, as, as sort of Stephen said and, and, and Volker mentioned as well, you, you need to quantify that uncertainty somehow. So I, I don't think you need a whole lot of reconciliation, really. You just need to kind of capture um, capture the, the variability, I suppose. Just a range of possible parameter space. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Okay, Fiona's been waiting for uh, 13 minutes now. And Fiona, you, have a, you want to ask your question? I see you chirp back on. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is this is a, an idea I've had for a long time, but it, it's never quite come to fruition. And it's one of the things that the pandemic has actually precipitated. And that is that we've started inverting our workflow because we haven't been able to go into the field. So for a long time, I've been suggesting that rather than having a conceptual model, going into the field and collecting data and then applying a process-based model it would be quite interesting to do the process-based models first to condition our thinking and our experimental design in the field. And because we haven't been able to go in the fields, uh, and I'm thinking here about some specific geochemical pool to chemistry experiments or field studies we want to do, it's actually forced us to advance our modeling to a more sophisticated level before we go in the field. And I'm really curious whether looking back in two or three years time, will say, wow, that actually really helped, or whether just like a conceptual model produces a straight jacket for your thinking when you're in the field, whether a process-based model will do exactly the same. I guess it depends on how well you think you can model the processes. It's interesting. I don't think that just necessarily applies to creating these sort of, um, numerical models, but also things like seismic interpretation. Do you do... Mm -hmm your seismic interpretation before you go into the field or, or afterwards, you know, or, you know, read certain papers before you go into the, into the field or not. So I think that's a, it's an open question and certainly interesting to, to compare what would, what would happen. Yeah. So Fiona, you're basically saying you 
come up with multiple working hypotheses derived from your models. It could be this or it could be that. And then you test the predictions of those models against what you actually see in the field. Precisely. I remember, I can't remember, sorry, Pete, I can't remember which paper it was, but you produced a fantastic paper with a conditional frequency map that identified, that did a, multi, a series of multiple forward models and identified a number of locations in space where the way that you set up your model affected the outcome and then identified other areas where different models would produce the same outcome. And that allowed you to identify where you might want to go and look in order to determine what set of assumptions may be less incorrect. You can put me right, Peter, if that's my wrong recollection of your paper, but I think it was a condition frequency map or something neat that you did. One of the many neat things you've done. Well, thank you, Fiona. That was, yeah, that, that, yeah. And in fact, that's what Dave has been showing some of those maps. It's essentially yeah. that method. But I, you know, I think the, the other, the other thing is, I think we perhaps need to try slightly change our mindset and accept that in, in some cases, possibly many cases, we might not be able to get to any one single answer. Mm -hmm. We might just need to say, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. And we just don't know at this point. And actually the great thing about admitting that is it drives you to collect more data yes. rather than just saying, oh yeah, that's all done. You know, we've got our triangles, it's fine. We can, we, it drives you to actually say, look, we don't really understand this. Let's go and collect more data. And I think that's, that's you know, that's how supposed to, how science is supposed to work, in fact. So I, I would strongly I, argue for that. Don't, don't try and deny the uncertainty. Embrace it. Let's, and let's it tells you what data to collect, right? Sorry. Thanks, Fiona. So let, let's sharpen that pencil. And the next comment was from Marina Gomez. And she said... Professor Walter Lewin in an MIT physics class said any measurement that you make without the knowledge of its uncertainty is completely useless, <laughs> Sorry, completely meaningless. Is this valid for carbonate science? True. <laughs> Peter, why don't you handle that one? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. That's a really interesting. It, it, probably, yes. Yes, I, and I think there is definitely a tendency to, as I was just saying, there's a tendency to ignore the uncertainty and think that because you've come up with an answer, that's it. So, so yeah, I, I actually, I tend to agree. I mean, is it completely useless because, you know, you learn something, but it would certainly be more meaningful if we, if we, if we acknowledge, if we thought that there was uncertainty associated with everything and accepted that, yes. David, you care to add to that? Yeah, I don't think it's, it's just valid just for, for carbonate science. I think it's sort of valid for science in general. But um, yeah, I, I don't think that the data itself is is completely useless. We can, you know, going back to some of Isaac's talks and, and um, the, the talk from the previous session, we can sort of put all that data into, you know, machine learning bins or categories or something like that and come back to later on. And, and perhaps that data will be useful uh, at a later date. So not completely meaningless, but maybe leaning that way. Mm. Okay. On, on, on towards meaningless, let's say. <laughs> Can you quantify that? <laughs> <laughs> meaninglessness, okay. Uh, keep, keep it moving, Volker, you'll come up in just a second, but we had a comment from Alex Brazier, and he said, listening to this discussion, he said, it sounds like a strange version of BBC Radio 4, was marking, I have a question for the modelers. Is my career in photography and field geology safe for the next 24 years, or will I be replaced by a robot like has happened in so many other disciplines? Well, you know, I read that, Alex, and I was thinking about what, what would a geological field robot do? I mean, look, we, we have one on Mars, right? But it's very much being directed in, in what it does. So it's not um, autonomous, is it? So imagine an, an autonomous outcrop geo robot you know my 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 prediction will be that for probably quite a long time into the future it, it will be walking into the field area and it will end up like trying to sample somebody's garden wall before it gets near any any outcrop so because I, I think you know it's a, that kind of ai problem is really tough so i don't think it's gonna be the case that that anybody's replaced by that technology for a long time and you know models Ford models, statistical analysis, whatever, all this quantitative stuff, it does not replace at all the need to go into the field. I think it just perhaps slightly changes maybe what we do when we're in the field, how we think about the data that we collect, but it doesn't negate at all the need to go and do field work, I, I don't think. 
uh, and you heard my opinion on robots. I'm, I'm all for them. Um, you know, if you can spend more time thinking than going through the through the tasks and, and sort of the manual tasks of sort of collecting that data and things like that, um, then then spend more time thinking about it. What, what does it all mean? And, and put it into some sort of uh, making some sort of sense out of it. It's a good point, David. Anyone who's measured a couple of kilometers of core at a sitting would, would, would agree with that, I think. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, Volker, you had your hand up next. Yeah, it's about that uncertainty business again. So, uh, you know, okay, if you, you know, if you have three numbers, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to do statistics on them. Huh? So you need to have uh, uh, many, many measurements to come up with, uh, 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 with uncertainties or statistics and uncertainties. And I think the new, new style geology, like taking drone-based uh, uh, outcrop, uh, you know, large areas, and not only do it in 2D, like a dip section, but look at in canyon systems where you get true 3D exposure, you know, will, uh, will get us to the point where we have uncertainties and it, it does get us already to the point where we will need to start thinking about processes and how you know, sediments were deposited much, much, much more. And you know, I, uh, you know, I, I think we need to get to this. We need to utilize these new, new technologies and make them, um, make them also public because I know we, th there's, there's efforts ongoing, for example, to have a repository for drone surveys, yeah? so where you can publish drone surveys, uh, uh, make them publicly available. They can be cited, right? So you can you can get your credit for it for an academician, and and then other people can extract uh, statistics out of it or can do machine learning on it, etc. And uh, but one one aspect also to the other question: Will it make us? Uh, uh, redundant, right? I, I mean, all the drone surveys that I've seen really need require a lot of ground truthing. So, so, uh, so no, it won't make us redundant, but it will give us much, much more data to allow to actually produce statistics and uncertainty. Yeah, and look back at uh, models and and make them better. You know what, Volker, the thing that strikes me about these digital outcrop data sets is, I mean, and they're fantastic, aren't they, in lots of ways, but I, I have the impression, and maybe I'm wrong, because maybe I'm just not seeing the, 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 the particular projects and publications, but they seem to me actually at the moment quite underutilized. I don't see people really taking them apart and making breakthroughs in our science using those data. And what we tend to do somewhat ironically is draw lines on them and draw triangles on them just as we would with a with a, an outcrop and you know th there has to be i would have thought some step change making use of those data the way that machine learning has made use of you know all the different computer vision stuff huge data sets on the internet and such like to drive the development of those algorithms I think we need something like that. If I was starting out now as a researcher, I think that's something that I would be looking to try and get into because it must be a huge area to, to develop over the next 10 or 20 years. There might be some sort of snobbery there, Peter. And, you know, people see these sort of remote sensing or remotely acquired data sets and you, you think, well, it can't be as good as collecting the data in the field and people just don't, don't use it. And um, that's why it's being underused. Well, it's true you don't get to... Good. You don't get to you don't get to hang out in London now as much as you would if you collected the data yourself. But exactly, I, I, I think just the sheer volume of information that is in those data sets is what to me is is tempting about them. Yeah, Isaac, you had your hand up first, and then Volker, you're next. And we are try to keep it short. We have about four minutes left on my account. Isaac, uh, yeah. So just one final thought. Actually, I'll keep it short. I think, uh, do you think that inviting people who are computer science experts to collaborate in our research groups is the way forward? Because the way I see it, even me, I'm not comfortable quantifying things to that extent, unless there's a computer science expert to make, you know, sense of the numbers with me, you know? Do you think that that's the way forward? Like computer science people integrated in our teams? Yeah, I think it is, Isaac, it's, it's just, a little bit difficult to persuade them that rocks are a good thing to expend all their effort on. You know, they're busy with the problems of, of, of deep 
you know, true artificial intelligence and so on. And we're saying to them, we want to look at rocks. I mean, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm also being serious. It's quite hard to get those kind of cross-disciplinary teams together because, you know, what they're, they're, people are busy and they've got their own problems to work on. So I think we really do, if we're going to do that, we need to really make the case to people why it is so important that we, you know, evaluate subsurface uncertainty or whatever it is. We really need to make the case to people that it's worth their time to invest in our subject. And I think in industry as well, that there, there is a push, you know, generally to hire a lot of data scientists and computer scientists that don't necessarily have um, a geological background. That there's more and more of these people joining joining the business and sort of using that knowledge and applying it to geological problems. So I think we'll see lots more integration as we go forward as more people with bright ideas join this sort of sphere of geology. Borg, we've got about a minute and a half. Okay, just a quick one on, on these uh, data sets that, that Pete uh, uh, alluded to. So many companies now are aware that they have these huge data sets. They don't know what to do with them anymore. And they are very happy to donate them to, uh, to data repositories where others can utilize it. And it's a big issue. I think there are some people working on, on repositories like this, and we need to support that and, and make it citable and, and so people get credit. But that will you know, provide enormous amounts of data to everyone to get statistics, test models, etc. Done. Yeah, it's a good point, Volker. But once we've got the repositories, we also then need the algorithms to interrogate them. And, and that's kind of what I'm talking about being the, the, the real challenge for us to develop, I would say, you know, the, the, the things that will allow us to extract meaningful information from those digital outcrop data sets automatically without triangles. I'm going to stop now.